here and today and on a daily basis in order to declare that shifting lifestyles can have a real positive impact on society and the environment. So for us, it's quite exceptional to have a student on a panel rather than only professional. So uh, curious to hear what uh, Juliette will tell us. So personally, I strongly believe that private bankers moving forward will have to change their strategy, not selling something to the investors, but more listening to the investors and what in matters to investors will need to matter to private bankers. So most probably wealth planning uh, will be for the family future at every stage of the life. So taking in consideration risk appetite, financial return, responsible investing and impact investing. But f enough from my side. So Juliette, you are part of the future of this world and planet. I will start with you, so please let us know if you care and what your expectations are regarding your financial objectives and the requirements you would have in the future to your banker. Okay. So yes, thank you, uh, Anne-Marie, for inviting me. This is a, a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, as a future in investor myself, I have two main requirements, um, talking about investments mainly. Um, the first one is um, the, avail the uh, availability of measurements and results. Uh, it's really important to me to be able to know how my investments will have an impact, um, whether it's financially or uh, especially uh, environmentally and socially. I truly believe that financial performance is no longer enough. Um, yes. <laughs> so the climate emergency no longer allows us to put the financial performance first. Um, and as we all know, sustainability is not currently a crucial part of making investments. Um, it is nearly impossible to get a comprehensive overview of a company's positive impact and this has to change for the new generation of investors. It has to be um, delivered at eye level with them in a simple and convenient way um, in order to be able to shift uh, the lifestyle of the, the, youngest, uh, the younger generation and to actually um, have an impact and make sustainable investments um, a big part of the world of finance. Kill this one. No, it works. Thank you, Juliette. So, uh, Thomas, we have heard uh, Juliette uh, mentioning. So, it's not about performance. So, it's more about impact and uh, so uh, creating uh, environmental change. So. Does that mean that uh, for you also uh, the language to be used moving forward uh, with your clients uh, will have to change and investors may talk differently now? Oh my God. So, uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I think you, you mentioned two very important uh, topics that are transparency and simplicity. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's the game changer all of us face. Uh, how do we, first of all, make transparent what is, um, yeah, what really ESG means for us uh, as, a, as a company, but as well for the investments we are doing? And how do we transform this very technical language into simple words that can be understood by everybody without uh, writing a master thesis about, about ESG? And what we see are two, two type of clients uh, in the private bank. They are the ones, the, the ultra high network clients, so already wealthy people that have already in the past been engaged in charity or philanthropic investments and that now partially uh, change their focus or entirely change their focus to impact investing with a more ethical focus. And then there is uh, the next gen investors like you. Uh, that have a natural uh, yeah, view, a different view already, uh, because they have been growing up in an environment of transparency where, where the problems uh, of the pollution in the world are getting much more obvious than it has been in the past. 
and um, we have to make sure that we we guide the younger generation towards that process of change. And then we have the third bucket, the more institutional clients, where we provide the underlying data and facilities to consult their own clients. Thank you, Thomas. So I, I, I think uh, the language we are going to use in the future may, uh, may change then uh, in, in regards to investment advice, but also in regards to investor requirements and uh, can be sometimes vague and uh, imprecise. And uh, so then, Alice, uh, the bankers will turn to you and say, like, perform me some analysis because here is what my investor uh, would like uh, to receive. So while performing this analysis, just let me know how you protect the company, the investor, and, and uh, so what, what are the means you can apply to gardening against greenwashing? Because we heard Pierre Graminia also talking about greenwashing. David mentioned it before as well, so uh, curious to hear you. So, hello everybody. I, I believe calling out greenwashing can be as complicated as making these microphones work today. But on a more serious note, um, First of all, I have to explain a bit like about greenwashing. Nowadays, everything with like the investors willing to have a positive impact, such as Juliet, such as me, for example, we tend to want a very pure portfolio in terms of sustainability, meaning we want positive Im impacts. And we tend to forget that every good and service, as good as and as sustainable as they can be, also have negative environmental impact that need to be measured and that need to be presented to the investor mm -hmm. to show them your sustainable, sustainable portfolio has this positive impact but also has this negative impact. So about greenwashing and analyzing companies that we want to, impl to put into our portfolios, we have several ways to try to differentiate greenwashing. First of all, we can first see the difference between the corporate marketing uh, that we usually see in, um, in some of the re their reports, such as having a positive impact on all the 17 SDGs, um, and saying, oh, we have a positive impact, for example, on decent work SDG 8, because we provide work to, co to people. Indeed, that's great, but that's what every company does. Like, how do you provide this, uh, this work? Is, is, it, um, is it the decent work or not, and everything like this? So we rely on quantitative data, independent data, and often this is what we're missing the most, like the data. And from, com from companies and also from estimations, because some things are very difficult to estimate, as we have already discussed, for example, for scope-free emissions. Um, it's important also to always put into perspective the achievements of, um, of the companies compared to the peers, and also some sectors have a lot of negative impacts, such as, um, such, as, such as the construction sector, but we will not stop building uh, buildings. So this is why we have to find some, like the best way to avoid emission, to avoid waste, to avoid all of this, and put, and realize that sometimes the current solution we have now is the best we have from this company, it's like not perfect, but it's the best we have and it's the best effort and uh, we continue to engage them and encourage them to disclose data and to get better um, on uh, the part that are still not perfect. Um, but yeah, we have to rem remember that there is greenwashing, there is sustainability, but it's not just black and white and there are always like some um, negative aspects of it that everybody should be aware of when they invest. Thank you, uh, Alice. So you mentioned uh, some companies like construction, or, or they might, you, you cannot avoid negative impact uh, if you want to create positive impact. So uh, that leads to the discussion. So what is better to engage with the company you are invested in or, or to divest? So that is always a dilemma uh, investors have. So uh, um, offloading pollution um, and uh, less accountable uh, or responsible owners, so should we just turn our back and, uh, and say we, we divest? Or could it also be uh, that we say we engage because that will help uh, these companies uh, to finance their transition to a cleaner way of operating? And uh, so maybe I start with you, Thomas. Uh, so which would be your choice, divesting or engaging? Uh, 
I do believe that uh, the capital is the fuel of all industries. And we are the industry that is steering the capital of all industries. So we, we do have a duty of care. If we go for the way of divesting or exclusion, that, that has never been led to an improvement. Uh, we, we basically ignore those companies, but we, we know we're going to need all type of industries. This is why we believe much more in engagement, uh, where we basically monitor the investments, but as well identify the ESG issues, engage with the management, and finally vote at the general meetings. So if we go the exclusion way, we will not support the companies to improve. If we go for the engagement way, we're going to help them on their journey, and I think we have to value as well uh, the journey they are going. Uh, and companies start from different levels. We have modern industry that, with, with companies that, has, that have just been built up over the last years that start in a very different environment. And then you have traditional industries which have to take a much longer journey to transform. But we have to value that transformation uh, the same way that we value the you know, maybe high standards of modern technologies already. So y you would say the best is always engagement, uh, so in order to make that transition. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Alice, you certainly have an opinion on that one as well. <laughs> So yeah, I participate in the engagement strategy at Banque de Luxembourg Investments, and um, I think this question is a bit complicated because if you if you come from an external point of view, from the investors, and if I think, for example, of my mom and dad that would see sustainability as something very pure, they would be like, if I invest in a sustainable portfolio that says that it cares about climate change, I don't understand how I could have some energy companies that are still involved in oil, in oil and gas. But the issue, I think, investment on as a positive impact when it's uh, it, in terms of uh, what you offer to your clients, meaning if you want to have a truly perfect portfolio and not having energy companies in it, you can just decide not to put this in. However, I agree with Thomas saying that so far, I mean, if the entire industry, the entire world would divest from companies that, don't, that have uh, very uh, negative impacts, then yes, it would have a pos uh, positive effect. But if just our company or a few companies divest, what will happen? It's just that we sell the shares and the shares are bought by someone else. It's not the company that is, is not losing money from the fact that you sell the shares, except if she when you're a very large company, and then, yeah, you're going to have some influence. But us being smaller, if we sell the chess, just someone else will, will buy it. I don't say that we should never divest. It's not the case. In some cases, we do divest. Um, but I, I believe engagement can have a more positive impact, uh, especially when you want to have more data from the company or on smaller and mid-cap that don't necessarily know where to start their journey. Uh, it's very interesting to, to show them what we believe is important at the moment and what initiatives they should follow to have um, a better, in, um, I mean, a better impact with their products or a lower uh, contribution to climate change. And so this is how I believe engagement can have a very positive impact and I would also go mostly uh, towards uh, engagement in terms of impact and not just in terms of uh, image, let's say, and uh, what would the client believe is pure or impure. So would you say there is an art of influencing? So, uh, you know, that when you engage, or well, there must be an art of influencing. I believe, for example, that in the art of influencing, collaborative engagement can have a bigger power than just uh, individual engagement, and we try at, at BLI to do some collaborative engagement with uh, other asset management companies to show the investors, first, we are, uh, we are several uh, investors that care about that, so we have more power in the uh, general assemblies. And it's always important, I think, not just to blame the company and say, look, you're doing this, it's not good, but also trying to show them like, what could be the positive impact of changing and switching business model. Because in the end, the companies also care a lot about their profit, profitability, obviously, and, uh, if they, and they are afraid of making too many changes. So I, I think companies would be changing if they see the tangible benefits of it. 
Thank you, Alice. So it can be tempting, nevertheless, to focus on smaller startups because engaging with larger companies, so you must be, and you said if you're a small investor, so you may not necessarily have a lot of impact uh, so while engaging, but with startups, uh, so they might potentially offer solutions to sustainable issues on one side, and they will be more also listening to their investors because they depend on their, on their money in, in order to grow. So maybe, Juliette, I uh, ask you the question, so because you have recently been very close uh, to start up in Denmark, so uh, what, what do you think uh, uh, about scale and impact? So is impact more easy realized uh, with a larger scale? Uh, so share with us the experience you just have gone through in Denmark. Yes, so I have been doing an internship at Make Impact, which is a fintech startup that helps the younger generation to actually get knowledge to start investing with an impact. So they are targeting people between the age of 18 and 35 years old. And I feel like it, it can be quite surprising to choose that kind of target group because some people may say that they don't have the money to invest. But the question is that, is it really that important to have a big, um, a big amount of money to actually start changing the mindset you have um, around the subject of finance. Uh, I feel like, I, I actually I had a talk with uh, one of the co-founders at Make Impact and we were talking about that very subject and he told me that, you know Juliet, um, having money is not the biggest part of it. Uh, if you can get the young uh, generation of investors to start thinking about that alternative way of investing, that's already a very good start because the money will come later. And when the money actually does arrive, they will be, because they will have the knowledge, they will be able to actually have a, make a change and have an impact with their money because they will be educated on that subject. So I feel like targeting that group is really important even though um, they don't have that big amount of money in their bank account to actually invest. Um, so scaling, um, about scaling, um, I feel like it's harder to uh, build trust with such a small startup because they don't have much experience in that area and maybe it would be easier to uh, trust a bigger company that have many years of experience and that know what exactly know what they are doing but in a sustainability wise i think they can actually bring more uh, opportunities to the to the young investors thank you julie thomas you certainly have uh, an opinion also on scale or and impact or is it better larger companies or smaller companies I would directly answer to, to what you said. Uh, when we talk about the, does it have an impact how much money you finally invest or do you have as a wealth, I think the, the young generation has a wealth that former generation didn't have, which is your voice. Uh, you might not have the money directly to have an impact now, but your voice is much more heard than it has been in the past. I think I listen much more to my, uh, to my kids than my parents have done with me. And the generation before, again, was different. So I think there is a massive impact with the voice that the next generation uh, is raising because it uh, affects all of us. And we, we see the initiatives around the globe are happening by the young people. And uh, it's heard, it's seen, and there is a reaction on it. This is really tricky. <laughs> so uh, as we're coming uh, to the end of our panel, so I think you said already this is really a message and uh, I would uh, invite my panelists then really to pass on the message to take away here from our discussion, which was very interesting. And I think my takeaway is certainly uh, listen to the younger generation. They know what to talk about and they can educate us uh, in the way forward. Alice, your turn. <laughs>